Good morning and welcome to the Atlantic Council. Uh, this is uh, an on record Atlantic Council's Iraq Initiative program. We are honored to have with us His Excellency Dr. Fuad Hussein, Iraq's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Deputy um, Prime Minister for International Relations. Uh, the, my name is Abbas Kadim. I'm the director of the Iraq Initiative Program at the Atlantic Council. Um, Dr. Fuad Hussein is in no need for introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Um, he was a, um, in, active in the um, Kurdish cause for many years, a lifetime. He graduated with a degree in English from the University of Baghdad. Uh, he then moved to um, the Netherlands to uh, get a, a higher degree, um, a, a doctorate degree in Amsterdam. Uh, he uh, returned to Iraq after the regime change uh, in 2003 and uh, spent a number of years serving in the Kurdistan regional government uh, as a cabinet level member and and that was between 2005 and 2018. Uh, he also was an alternate uh, member in the governing council uh, that uh, Iraq had after the, um, the, the regime change or the liberation. Uh, he uh, came to national politics also after that in 2018, served uh, since then, uh, first as a minister of finance uh, in the Adil Abdel Mahdi's government, then he uh, became a Minister of Foreign Affairs in um, Mustafa al Kadhimi's government. And now he is serving in um, Prime Minister Mohammed Shia al Sudani's uh, government as a Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he also, in both uh, roles as Finance Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, held the position of a Deputy Prime Minister uh, for Economic Affairs. Uh, first, and now he is a Deputy Prime Minister for uh, International Relations. Uh, and I must say that he served uh, with great distinction, uh, with great competency, and I've seen, uh, had the privilege of seeing his work. We also must say that, you know, I always say it, and Iraq's biggest successes are in the foreign relations uh, field, and uh, that is a great credit also for um, you, sir, and for the ministry that had um, many predecessors uh, before you. We are always uh, proud of the accomplishment of the Iraqi Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So uh, without uh, any further uh, ado, I would like to start us by um, giving the, um, His Excellency the, the Minister uh, the chance to set the stage for us with a and early remarks, short remarks for us, to tell us about uh, this trip, which is a very important trip. It is, as I understand it, the first time we have a delegation coming from Baghdad to Washington, D.C., with a mission devoted completely to, the, to, to economics and to trade relations, uh, an important uh, aspect of U.S.-Iraqi framework, strategic framework agreement, uh, that often uh, needs uh, more uh, emphasis and more work, uh, and we are glad to see that. Um, and also, um, in addition to this trip, its purpose and what it was accomplished, since we are lucky now to meet when the trip is concluding, and also on the Iraqi governance program, uh, of, of Mr. Mohammed Shah Sudani's government, which you are a member of, sir, how the program has been uh, progressing, what are the accomplishments, what would Iraqis and Iraq watchers expect in 2023 uh, and also uh, beyond uh, on the main priorities of Iraqi government pro uh, government pro program? Uh, good morning. Uh, everybody and uh, Dr. Abbas, thank you very much for having me here and uh, thank you for organizing this uh, event and uh, I'm happy to be back in 
in this place, uh, Atlantic Council. I used to be here all the time when I was visiting uh, uh, Washington. Uh, usually when, when we start discussions with uh, and these kinds of events, uh, then the question is why we are here. Now I can say, what did we do? Because uh, it is the last day of my visit, and uh, so we can talk about what we have done, what did, did we achieve, uh, and of course, in the first place, why we came to, to Washington at this time. Uh, our visit is in the framework of uh, the good relationship within the United States. So in the first place, it is our duty to protect this relationship and to develop it. So we came to the United States just to strengthen the ties between Washington and Baghdad. This is the first uh, uh, target of the visit. Second, we are here, and this time we are focusing on economic ties and economic issues. Perhaps in the past we were visiting Washington and talking all the time about partnerships, but in different fields, especially partnership um, on security, military fields, because we were facing uh, security challenges. Uh, we were facing the fight against ISIS, and the United States was the main partner in our fight next to many other nations, next to many other forces. The United States was the main partner in our fight against ISIS. And thanks God, we were able together with many other nations, as I said, to defeat ISIS, to defeat the so-called Islamic State. So I call now, the, in this stage, the relationship between Washington and, and Baghdad the healthy one. So we reach a different stage. We, diff, we reach a stage in which we are talking about how to build our economy. What can the American companies do in Iraq? How can the American government help us in building or rebuilding our economy? And when we talk about our economy, we talk about various fields. Part of it has to do with uh, banks. Part of, part of it has to do with investing in oil. Part of, part of it has to do with um, producing gas. Part of it has to do with electricity. As well as we were talking about other sectors such as agriculture, tourism. In short, we were discussing matters, topics related to uh, our economy policy. We also uh, uh, discussed topics related to the internal politics in Iraq and external politics. External politics, which has to do with regional politics, but also uh, international relationship. This government, Dr. Abbas, has been mm, founded on the basis of a common program. And when I'm talking about common program, it is a common program of almost all Iraqi political parties. From the Shia side, we have got almost all political parties, Shia political parties, except the Sadris in the government. From Kurdish side, we have got the main two political parties, PUK and KDP. And that's also valid for the Sunni components. The main figures and political parties among the Sunni components, they are participating in this government. It is not only about participating in the government, because in the past we had it. Yes. We participated in various government, as you mentioned. I myself, I was in three, four cabinets. But this is the first time, I must say, 
we all, we are participating on the basis of clear program which we agreed upon. So we have in the first place a political program. Uh, and that's the result of the discussions, lengthy discussions uh, among the political parties and political leaders in Baghdad. And the program is covering all issues, especially economic issues. The political program, which has been agreed upon by the political parties, has been translated or became part of the government program. So the government program, in fact, is reflecting the desire and the wishes and the plans of the political parties. So, and the government program is clear. We are talking about targets that we want to reach, the plans that we have, but we are also mentioning the timetable and how we can cover it financially. That's why the discussion now about the budget law, which is a draft now, is, uh, is linking the budget law with the program of the government. So in which stage are we going to implement the next uh, plan? How are we going to implement that plan? And how can we cover that plan financially? So that, that will be in the, in the budget law. This government has got the support of, of about 280 members of the parliament. Yes. So when there will be decision, it will be easy to, to have the support of the parliament. So that is the, the second point, which is rather com comparing with other governments that we had is different. The third aspect which has, which has to do with this government is we have got a political leadership, a political council. This political council meets uh, almost once in a week. Yes. And the prime minister and the speaker of the parliament, they are both members of this political council. So we are coming together. We are dis discussing what we did, and we are discussing the next plan. The government is planning to uh, introduce various laws so that we can solve many issues which exist for a long time. Of course, one of the laws that has to do with the budget, the last year, the last two years, we didn't have budget law, and that created a huge problem, actually. Now we are going to have a budget law. The next law that we are going to introduce to present it to the parliament will be oil and gas law. Oil and gas was an issue yes. since 2005, actually. Uh, it was a an point of conflict sometimes. Uh, the discussion in our societies among and among the political parties, but also the tension sometimes about oil policy between KRG and uh, and federal government, but also sometimes this tension between Basra local government and, and central government or federal government, they were always there and it was not clear. Many times people were depending on the articles in the constitution yes. related to oil issue. But the reality was also there that because we didn't have a new law we were depending on the old laws, and this means, as for oil policy, we were going back to the laws which has been adopted or used by, by Saddam Hussein. So from one side, we had a law which, which has to do with the central government and uh, a policy which was very much centralized. From other side, we have got a constitution which is more liberal. So this conflict was always there. I think with the new oil law, oil and gas law, we can solve this problem and according to the constitution. Yes. So all these steps has been taken and uh, I'm really uh, optimistic about the future of the country because financially we are 
I can say we are in a good shape. And high oil price is also helping us. And we have got the plan. And this visit was about all these uh, subjects that I have mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is very helpful to, again, set the stage on, to this discussion to know where the government thinking is going. Uh, and certainly, it's an ambitious but manageable and possible program that you laid out uh, in the government when it was formed and you presented it to the parliament. Of course, with the government, you know, in the Iraqi system, yes, the government proposes many laws, but also the parliament needs to, um, to act on those and pass them. Um, and, and it's helpful to and, and, and hopeful to know that this mandate that you have from the parliament and the support because the government was not coming out of conflict but consensus uh, out of that. And sure, there is always, it's not unhealthy to have sometimes political rivalries in a democracy. And speaking of parliament, of course, parliament is also represented here by my friend, Dr. Adnan Zurfi, who is an active member in, in this important institution in Iraq, presenting or, or present with us. So my, I will get back to the, to the trip, but first let me take uh, it from where you ended with the laws. Uh, you mentioned the, um, the, the hydrocarbon law. This is very important for Iraq to really uh, put to rest a lot of this conflict, particularly between Baghdad and Erbil, but also uh, this law will, will solve a lot of our issues in terms of production, marketing, the use of the, the oil revenues in Iraq. And um, it's, it's a highly important. People were talking about it for a long time. What is holding us from in, in Iraq from getting that law passed? Uh, and, and what needs to be done to get it hopefully uh, passed this time around with, between this government and the friendly parliament? Dr. Abbas, uh, <coughs> There was an initiative to present uh, uh, hydrocarbon law in 2007. At that time, we didn't succeed. Uh, when I am talking about we didn't succeed, <coughs> it is about the government and the parliament, we didn't succeed to reach an agreement among ourselves. So this is the first time that we are coming back and we are going to present a new law. <coughs> By the way, the government, in the government plan, there is a clear paragraph about yes. having a high, uh, new hydrocarbon law within six months. Yes. So we committed ourselves. We are committed to the program of the government that we must have a, a hydrocarbon law within six months. And that discussion already started. The discussion, uh, the Ministry of Oil has got a team they are discussing that, but not only ministry. Of course, this, this law is very sensitive. So it is not only the Ministry of Oil who is discussing the draft of the law, but they started their team. And there is also a team from KRG side. They are, pres they are going to present uh, uh, their own opinion about yes. this. But uh, we are going to have a wide discussion uh, among uh, various uh, ministries, but also various groups, so that when we will prepare the law, and as I said, the process of discussion started already, uh, then there will be a kind of consensus about this law. Because you mentioned the word consensus. I think that's the key word. Uh, that's the key word to, to reach uh, the conclusion and to have uh, uh, hydro carbon law. But I'm really, this time, I'm optimistic because of the reason that I mentioned. So preparing for the, the law and readiness of Baghdad, Erbil, other parts of the country to have a new law and uh, having support in the parliament. So all these aspects will help us this time to, uh, to have our new law. Will it be an amended version of the 2011 law, or it's going to be uh, a new law from the drawing? No, no, all these drafts will be on the table. Already they are on the table, all these drafts. And perhaps there will be a new, new, new version. Uh, but at the end, uh, before sending the law to the parliament, 
there must be a kind of consensus among the political parties so that we cannot create the same problem which we had in 2007. Also, two related things that have to do with the, uh, the government plan to develop Iraqi economy more, and I will also probably discuss it with your permission. Uh, but there are two other laws that, or, or two other steps that Iraqis are waiting for. One is uh, a census. The last credible census we had in Iraq, probably people referred to the one in 1957. But there have been other census that was conducted over 10 years during the Ba'athist time. Each one of them had some positive, but a lot of negative things about it. Some of them were politicized. A lot of demographics were, were tampered with. Uh, and there was one uh, supposed to be done in 2020, in fairness to the government, COVID, and also the political instability uh, thwarted that plan. Do we have realistic expectation that we will see a census um, conducted in 2023 or 2024? Uh, also, uh, the other thing is the constitutional re reform. I know these are two big ticket items. I was in Baghdad and we attended a couple of conferences uh, with people who are in involved in the constitutional writing like Sheikh Omar Hamoudi and people who are in the government right now. And there seems to be no, no inclination to do um, real sweeping constitutional reform or even the constitutional reform that is called for in the Constitution, but people are trying to see, you know, just maybe tackle one or two issues. Uh, I know it's very hard because of the, everybody is getting a, a veto for the first iteration, at least, of con constitutional reform. But I think these need to... Uh, to be done because it fits in what you just mentioned. If we were to utilize our resources to the best, if we were to make a new economic program, we need to know what the demographics of Iraq look like, what our situation on the ground looks like. We also need to do away with some of the constitutional impediments towards laws like the hydrocarbon law and the other economic uh, plans that the government might uh, put together and, and then finally move Iraq to a better place. I think, Dr. Abbas, you mentioned an important uh, subject, which has to do with census. Indeed, when uh, people in Iraq they are talking about census, they are going back in the first place to 1957. Uh, yes. So that is during the monarchy time. That's right. <laughs> and there was a uh, census uh, organized in 1997. That's right. By Saddam Hussein's regime. But the, that uh, didn't include the Kurdish area. Correct. Because at that time, so it was a, a, a completely a different census than comparing with others. Uh, indeed, census is important for economic plan, for education plan, for health care, uh, for, for, for almost for everything. Do you know in in Iraq, how they are calculating the number of the population of the country. By the food rational? You, you see, by the food rational, but also they go back to 1979. 79. And they say, OK, the population of Iraq at that time, we had so many millions of people. So we add 2.5% or 3%. And then yeah. they are calculating. So when you are asking our officials or our people about how many millions do you have in Iraq? Some people, they are talking about 35 million, some people about 36, some people are talking about 40. The reality is nobody knows exactly. Yes. This is the reality. So we need census. We need census to have a good economic plan. Yes. And it is unfortunate. Census, to organize census, has been decided, I think, 10, year, 10, 10 years ago. But there were political reasons why yes. they did it. It was not because of the fact that we couldn't organize uh, having census, but uh, there were some political reasons. I think now we reach the stage and we can agree about that to organize it. So, and uh, we have good discussion about that. Uh, so to organize census is important as to have hydrocarbon law or oil and gas law. <coughs> they are both very important for the country. As for the amendment of the constitution, 
this goes back also for 10 years uh, discussion in the parliament, but also outside the parliament. Uh, our constitution is, is a liberal constitution, I may say. Uh, I believe that the Iraqi constitution is a very good and one of the best, perhaps, in the Middle East. But the implementation of the Constitution has got some problem. No. You see, there are about 50 articles in the Constitution which needs to be translated into laws. And until now, we are struggling with that. So we, when, when you have got articles in the Constitution which needs uh, to be translated in, in, uh, in laws. If you don't have it, then you go back to the old laws. And all those, all of them, almost all of them, has to do with the, the government of, uh, or regime of Saddam Hussein. And here we had got problems, actually. Once again, which I mentioned that. Between a system which, which is part of the past and would, which doesn't fit in our constitution, and the constitution which is more liberal. So we need more laws uh, to translate the con constitution into reality. Having said that, still there are some articles in the constitution which needs amendment. And uh, there are various groups which has been formed. Also the president has formed a group <coughs> to discuss uh, these articles uh, and how to amend these articles. Thank you very much. Uh, this is very helpful. Again, I think I, doing those constitutional reforms, I know it is a very hard process to go through, but they will help a lot, uh, you know, whether it's a law, a, a, an amendment or even a law to, uh, to, to uh, establish a federal uh, Supreme Court. Now, as you know, the federal Supreme Court, everybody, you know, if, if, if it uh, rules for you, uh, then you take it. If not, you say this is not even a constitutional. In a way, I don't mean your excellency, but the Iraqis, all parties. Uh, again, the other laws that you just mentioned. Uh, one more uh, thing about the domestic uh, uh, economic situation, and I know that your trip here is all about the economics, so maybe we could get out of the way a couple of things, is the issue of the dinar. As you all know, that uh, this has been a, a, a big debate in Iraq, a debate that goes from the grocer to the banker to people in between in expertise. Everybody in Iraq has an opinion. So we have about 40 million opinions in Iraq about this issue of the rate ex exchange rate between the dinar and the dollar. You were a member of the government that uh, voted, as, as, a, uh, I, as far as I understand it, on the new uh, uh, rate of the dinar to dollar um, back uh, during al Qadimi's government. And you are now a member also of the government that uh, voted for the new rate, uh, which recently has been there. First, where do you stand on that? Uh, and also, what do you think is the proper uh, policy for setting that rate, and is it an, what, what is being done in Iraq with the dinar to dollar an issue of ec pure economics, or is it an issue of politics, or is it something that encompasses both? Uh, because, again, with the white paper, which received a lot of international uh, uh, recognition and support, um, and you know, was was an excellent plan. In fact. It gave Iraq great uh, uh, opportunities. I always say that the government uh, of um, Mustafa al kadhimi now they are not with us, but you are a member of that, was the one government that delivered Iraq better than it was rece received by it. You know, no, Iraq in October of two, 2022 is nowhere how Iraq in May of 2020 when you had uh, Iraq in, uh, with the Kadhimi's government. Iraq was able at the time to pay salaries. The economics were in terrible shape. Oil was uh, trading for, you know, from minus to, you know, 40 at the best time. But those economic steps that you took uh, helped Iraq first get out of the bottleneck, but also accumulate a healthy 
reserve and you know both in gold and in, in cash. Uh, but again, the, the, the perceptions and the politics seem to be against that trend. So by this new decision, are we scaling back on that opportunity or are we doing the right thing by putting or placing the dinar where it is today? Dr. Abbas, each <coughs> stage is different. Uh, when, uh, and that's valid also in dealing with the currency and dealing with the economic policy. Each stage is different and each government has got its own priority. Yes. These are facts. Uh, as for the exchange rate, uh, and for the last, uh, let's say, cri crisis, which, uh, which had to do with dollar and dinar, uh, The reality, the roots of this, this, what happened in the last few weeks, has to do with the fact that uh, the, the central government, yes. in cooperation with the Treasury, but also in cooperation with the Federal Reserve Bank here, uh, they implemented a system a system to control the movement of dollars. This system has been discussed for the last two years. Has been discussed. So when we reach the time to implement and to use that system, it created reaction in the, in the market. It created both economic reaction, but also psychological reaction. Because people, those who were dealing with dollar, even the, the bank system was not used to deal uh, with, the, uh, with the system which has been, in fact, it's a kind of SWIFT, yes. which has been implemented. <coughs> okay. So that, that led to huge reaction. But it led also that the control on dollar's movement, of course, there was less dollar in the market, or there was less supply, and the demands stayed as it is. So when there was less supply and, and the demand as it was, stayed as it is, and because of psychological reaction, people started to buy dollars, so the price went high. Otherwise, the contact with the Federal Reserve Bank here and with Treasury was the same. But to, uh, when uh, the swift system has been implemented, it created a reaction in the market. So what happened now? Gradually, people are going to use this system. And they are going to integrate their own uh, way of dealing with dollars into, into, into this bank, bank system. Do you know that uh, many businessmen they were functioning, they were working, they were selling dollars or buying dollars outside the whole bank system. They were doing that, bring somebody in China or somebody in Turkey or in other countries and sending 100,000 <coughs> of dollars or the other way around. So this was all, the whole activity, the whole currency activity. <coughs> Uh, was mostly outside the bank system. Now, all is going to be included. <coughs> this will control the process of dollar. Each dollar which will be sent by the central bank to other banks uh, will be registered. The whole process will be registered. And the end users, the end user also will be well known. In fact, this is in the benefit of Iraqi currency. It is in the benefit of Iraqi economy. Because then you can manage the whole policy, monetary policy. Otherwise, uh, we had the same problem as we had in the past years. So I think after this visit, and I feel it, I see it, I read it, that the price of dollar is going to settle 
to settle as we wanted. And the, here, I may say, uh, there was support for the measures which has been taken by Central Bank, by Federal Reserve Bank, but also by Treasury, and also politically. Uh, there was huge support for the Iraqi monetary policy and Iraqi economic policy. So uh, I may say I am very much optimistic. And uh, I think uh, the issue which we had two, three weeks ago now is part of the uh, uh, history. We are going to deal with the currency in a different way. You mentioned the white paper. Still, we are believing in white paper. White paper is there and was uh, reform policy, in fact. And this government emphasized in its program uh, that it is a government of providing services. It is a government uh, which we are planning to diversify our economy, to reform, to fight corruption. So all these issues which exist in the white paper is part of the program of this government. I'm glad to hear that from you, uh, Your Excellency, because in Iraq, we need to more establish this culture of governments building on the successes of the previous ones, their predecessors, and then maybe fixing the, 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 the things that didn't work or take another approach. So, you know, the white paper, of course, uh, you know, might have been implemented initially in a way. It's a plan like all other plans. Once you implement it, you will take lessons. And so building on it, it's, it's very hopeful and, and, and very good. Um, now. Let me go back to, to your trip <coughs> and here. Uh, many people probably don't know that this trip was planned maybe in the first week after the government formation and uh, not something as it has been presented in certain circles that it is in reaction to the recent uh, debate. <coughs> I heard about it from the prime minister back in uh, the first week of uh, November, which is two weeks after the government formation. He mentioned again in public in, in December, and this was one of the hopes of the Iraqi government to, to take a new approach to the, to the U.S.-Iraqi relations and, again, the expansion of this. So what were the, the expectations or what was the agenda that you formed back in that time? And now that you are here and you added to it the the new items of, of the passing of time. And you are going to Baghdad after concluding this round, which I hear that it, a lot of it has been success. What are you taking to Baghdad with you in terms of accomplishments, uh, um, understandings or mutual understandings, things that you will go and tell the Iraqi people, this is what we came with, uh, and here is what, what we have accomplished in Washington whether it is on the uh, economic side, which is the main mission of the, of the delegation, but also on the um, bilateral relations. At the end of the day, you are, you are also wearing both hats. You are the Minister of Foreign Affairs, but also the mission that you were uh, quite rightly uh, tasked with. Um, I think after a while, uh, the joint communique will be published, will be announced. And in that communique, we, uh, both sides, we are talking about all these topics that I have mentioned, but also the subjects that you mentioned, that will be there. What we have done, <coughs> whom we met, uh, what was the result, how are we going to work together? But in short, I must say this was uh, our team, they are very much satisfied, and the reaction which we received from back home uh, is, uh, is very supportive. And the, uh, during the meetings here, we received a lot of support to this government, but also to the policy of this government. And people are very much interested that this government is a government for which aims to have reform in the economy. This is a government <coughs> which plans to provide service to our people. So there is a lot of support here 
in Washington. So I can say clearly, the friendship, the partnership with the United States will continue. The friendship and partnership will continue uh, on these fields. And we had good discussion with uh, the United States companies here, with the American companies here. And these companies, they promised also to be our partner. Or they will be partner of Iraqi private sector. Yes. So having American companies, having support of American administrations. We had also uh, talks in the Congress. Having support of uh, the various branches of the administrations here. And we will go back with this support. But we are happy also to announce that, that the monetary policy which has been developed and implement, implemented by the central bank has got support here from the United States. You see, there were some people inside our country. They were thinking that there is a plan in Washington against this government. Uh, there is a plan in Washington uh, against the policy of this government. But uh, I can assure you that uh, we and the American administration, we are partner. We are partners, and we will continue our cooperation together. Yeah, and I think a lot of people in Iraq and elsewhere, this is one of the peculiarities of this town. Uh, they don't really grasp the how complex decision making here is, and how the the relations, you know, the way our our um, the, um, system here in the in the United States works. So they make too much sometimes out of an internal debate, uh, but also I think it is uh, important to see and understand this, uh, uh, this, this debate in Washington and to see how it affects Iraq in the end result. Um, speaking of, of the um, talks you had with financial uh, and also with uh, businesses and, and the government, <clears throat> did you and, or the delegation speak with U.S. officials uh, about possible uh, support for the efforts to uh, boost the, the domestic gas protection, uh, production, uh, and, and uh, including with some more financial support uh, for projects. Not necessarily government money, but that included, but also possible major investments from uh, large investors uh, to be able to get that issue, which is, I know, one of the main items in the discussions and, and the conversations between the Iraqi government and, and the American uh, officials. And you know, every time there is a meeting, there is a mention of that. And it is actually, I think you agree, Your Excellency, it's, it's needed by now uh, to get that gas captured instead of having it flared with all the environmental um, consequences and also the, the, the loss of money from it. Uh, so, is there any any discussion or a plan to rely on large American investors or other support, financial supports from the United States to help Iraq increase the, the production of domestic gas? Thank you for <coughs> mentioning this because indeed gas and discussion around gas and capturing uh, flaring gas, investing in gas fields, uh, was one of the main topics that uh, we discussed. Uh, in various uh, meetings, three, four meetings, this was one of the uh, subjects that we uh, discussed. Um, um, when we are talking about capturing gas and uh, investing in gas sector, in fact, uh, 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 we are talking about uh, many things at the same time, for, in the first place. Iraq is an oil country, but Iraq can be an important gas, gas country. country. So combination of being an oil country and a gas country, <coughs> it gives the Iraqi economy huge power. But politically, strategically, 
then Iraq will be very important in the region. In investing in gas and capturing gas flares, it will bring huge income for, uh, for the country. In fact, now we are buying gas and electricity from Iran. Combination of four, the payment, is about $4 billion in, annually. So that means when you will produce your own gas, then, uh, of course, uh, you are not going to buy gas from other countries. Right. Independent. But you are going to be also independent on your own gas, not depending on gas of other countries. This is the second one. Third, as you mentioned, um, burning the gas <coughs> is really a threat to the environment, to the nature, but also to the health of the people. Imagine there are some studies in Basra about the, let's say, many, many people in Basra, they have got cancer disease. Right. So there are many experts. <coughs> They are linking that with uh, burning gas and, and oil fields. So that means we are going also to solve that problem. So investing in capturing gas, it solved many problems. Before coming here, we had uh, the Council of Ministers meeting. And one of the uh, issues that we discussed was about renewing the contracts which has been signed yes. with, with various international companies to invest in gas in Mansouria and other areas, which is from Mansouria Diala, it goes right. down to, to the south, <coughs> near the border, <coughs> Iranian border. Yes. So we are talking about huge gas fields as well as uh, Akas fails, that's in Ambar. In. <coughs> so the plan is there, and the decision we had, we already took that decision, and we are, financially we are going to cover it. So the discussion here, our experts, uh, we had members of the delegation, they were experts on these fields and gas fields. We had very good discussion with various companies here so that they can help us uh, uh, to produce gas. So that is on the table, and we have got the plan, we have got the companies, we have the decision, so we hope that we can translate all this into action within the near future. Great, thank you for that. Uh, I would like to mention to our esteemed audience that there is a microphone there, and we have a few minutes for people to ask uh, questions. And while that is happening, I want to ask you about another, one last question from me, which is basically, the, uh, in, in brief, the issue of water and the issue of the climate uh, in, in Iraq. I, as far as I understand, you did meet with uh, 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 Mr. Mr. Kerry, the, um, uh, the, the presidential envoy for for climate and also uh, you did also uh, have discussions. So um, are we getting more water now, especially this debate that these, these dams that Turkey has built are probably not the, the good plan. I don't know if there is a science to that or not, but maybe that will be there. And of course, our condolences to the Turkish government and the Syrian yeah. government for you. all of the tragic uh, consequence of, of that uh, that earthquake that happened. Uh, I know that Iraq has stepped up and helped in a great deal, and, and thank you duty. for doing that. You always put the the good relations, you know, ahead of you know differences, even when they exist, and that's that's great to know and, and to see. So where are we with the water, especially that our um, marshes are dependent on it, and our uh, agriculture itself is. And also the climate challenge, which I, you know, the, when the prime minister spoke to us the other day in, in a workshop, he said that one of his main priorities is the climate right now. We are shifting our priorities in Iraq. 
from security and, and other things to issues with the economy, with the climate, with water. So these are the new national security uh, drives, if you will, in Iraq. So how are we doing this while we are waiting for the questions? First, uh, you mentioned the meeting with uh, John Kerry. We had really a good, very good meeting, and we presented a draft of uh, memorandum of understanding between both sides. I may say it has been taken seriously, and already the discussion started about this uh, memorandum of understanding. We presented also three bro projects which has to do with the climate change uh, related to Iraq in this case. And uh, I may say uh, there was support and understanding from their side, so we are going to cooperate together uh, uh, with the American side on this issue. As for water and water resources, you see the threat which exists in Iraq is national threat, but it's also regional threat. So it is not only about Iraq, it is Turkey, Iran, other countries. They are all under the threat Express. of this climate change and less water, even in their countries, the drought is, is a phenomena in Iran and Turkey, except now, uh, as you mentioned, because of the earthquake, is different. Uh, so with Turkey, we were in good discussion, and uh, we will continue this discussion. But we recognize that it is not only Iraqi problem, it is also Turkish problem and Iranian problem. The dams which has been built in Turkey, it goes back to Turkic Uzalta. Yes. It's not is not established today. Uh, Turkish is when I'm talking about Turkish is I'm, I'm going back to 1980. 80. So it is it is an old uh, and the dam it has been established at that time. Although I remember there were some some uh, press release at that time. Turkish is said. Oh, uh, we are going to exchange water for oil. I don't know, was it, was it uh, that he said that? But that has been published at that time. But I don't think the Turkish government was using water as a, as a political product against, against other countries, in this case, against Iraq. But they were, they were trying to protect their waters and use it for uh, for producing electricity, but also for other reasons. However, we consider the two rivers, and Iraq is the land of two rivers, Mesopotamia, uh, is an international issue. Yes. It has to do with international law. So we were discussing with the Turkish side about our share, and we will continue that. Uh, I think, um, now the time and this, mm, is, is there to have different discussion with Turkish authority about this. I may say in many stages when we were in contact with Turkish officials, they were ready to discuss this matter. It is true we have uh, some issues with Turkey, but at the same time we are cooperating with Turkey on many fields. That's right. And um, of course, the trade relationship between Turkey and Iraq is huge. That's right. So everybody knows that. Perhaps on security level or military uh, operations, uh, Turkish military operations, we have got some differences. It's but, a geographical but fact. Still, All neighbors have yes, those borders. But still, we have good relationship <coughs> with Turkey. That's great. Sir, if you may identify yourself and ask you a question. Thanks very much. Excellency, thank you for being here with us today. Um, I'm Nathan Sales here at the Atlantic Council. Um, previously served at the State Department where I worked on counterterrorism issues and, and defeat ISIS issues. Um, I wanted to say how refreshing it is to be able to have this conversation with you about matters like trade and economics and energy rather than security. Um, it really speaks to the dramatic improvements in the security environment in your country. Um, 
having said that, I was hoping to get your thoughts on, on a security-related question, and, and that is uh, the ISIS remnants um, that still exist in the region. Could you maybe say a few words about um, the threat posed by uh, those elements, uh, the risk that they might reconstitute themselves? And in particular, I'd be grateful for your thoughts on efforts uh, your government might be pursuing uh, to repatriate ISIS fighters and families from camps in Syria uh, where they could either face justice for their crimes um, or be reintegrated in society. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for raising this uh, question. In fact, this was also one of the topics that uh, we discussed with the various uh, officials here in this capital. Uh, we were together and we fought together with many other nations, as I mentioned, and we defeated Islamic State, so-called Islamic State of, of ISIS. But that doesn't mean we de defeated ISIS as a terrorist organization. So once again, uh, ISIS went back to the roots. I mean, becoming once again a terrorist organization and instead of running a kind of state, uh, fighting a terrorist organization is completely different than fighting a, a state. Uh, so it depends on intelligence, it depends on information, exchanging information. Uh, there are now small groups uh, here and there, especially around Kirkuk and in some areas in Mosul. Uh, but as organization and, and, and uh, uh, terrorist organization, it's easier for us to fight them because we have got a lot of information about them. We know how to fight them. We know where they are. So we will continue to defeat them. This is a fact. They will be defeated at the end. But we have got a problem. ISIS is not only a military organization. It is also an ideological. So to defeat the ideology, that is completely different. And the ideology usually produces fighters. So the problem lies with how to fight the ideology. This is a problem. As for the camps, and here I'm talking about al Hor camp. Um, we have got about 70,000 people there, perhaps 30,000 of them, 31,000 of them, they are Iraqis. Iraqis. The rest, they are Syrians or from many, many other countries, but also from European and Russia or from China. They are all sitting there. Uh, as for the Iraqis, we started to bring back many families, women and children. We established a camp near Mosul, and we are obs observing with many other international organizations these camps, Correct. trying to re-educate their children. Because, uh, to be honest, um, we had this discussion during Adil Abdel Mahdi's cabinet. Correct. What to do with this camp? We were. At the end, on the basis of information that we received, we thought this is an ideological camp, and it is a kind of training camp to produce new new generation of terrorists. So we were really frightened when we observed, when we got the information, how they are educating their children. So we were thinking that they, those children, now they are children, but they will be the future leaders of terrorists the main leaders uh, among the terrorist organizations. So that's why this decision has been taken to bring back the Iraqis to, uh, to a, a kind of refugee camp near Mosul and uh, re-educate the children and to try to uh, push them and integrate, uh, ch uh, ch choose the process of integration into society in different way. Uh, I don't know the number, but uh, uh, the number of those people who came back, but uh, we are talking about five, 6,000 people, and the process is continuing. There are many other countries helping us uh, in this process, and I would like to uh, use this opportunity to thank these countries for their help and support. On the other hand, we have got problem with those foreigners inside Al-Hol camp. 
So they are European or Russian or Chinese. Uh, various countries, they decided to bring back their children, only their children. For example, the Russian, uh, with our help, with our support and coordination, uh, they took 120 children back to Russia. But that's also valid for some European countries. They took uh, some children back. But still, the main fighters, especially European fighters, they are there. And I have the feeling that many European countries, they don't like to have those fighters back. Because if they will be back, according to their own local law or national law, they will be perhaps in prison for one year or two years, being part of uh, terrorist organizations, and not because of the fact that they were criminal and they acted, because they acted in a different area, in another country. So they have got this legal problem. However, we are still in discussion with those European officials so that we can get rid of those people and they can be in their countries and they will be in prison in their own country. It is a problem, but we are thinking about solutions, especially for the Iraqis who are in the camp. Alex, uh, the last question, and we are about at time, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alexander Kravitz from Insight, and uh, thank you, Minister, for You're your remarks. Uh, I wanted to focus on, on energy and Baghdad Erbil relations. There, there have been delegations from Erbil visiting Baghdad. There has been the case in the Federal Supreme Court uh, on the oil contracts in, in the Kurdistan region, annulling them, um, and, and, and other developments. I wonder if you could just talk to us about how, how you see that, uh, those developments and, and the prospects. And since you talked about the, uh, on, on the energy field writ large, might you give us an update as well on the talks with Total and uh, where they stand? There, there was talk about them being uh, ready to leave and then not, uh, so uh, an update from you would be welcome. Thank you. Uh, Alex, for the first question, I think I mentioned the hydrocarbon law and the draft and the discussion and the meetings between both delegation, KRG delegation, and federal government delegation. And these meetings will continue, I think, within a short time. Uh, there will be, there will be uh, an uh, oil and gas uh, uh, about this law. There will be a draft. So there will be an agreement. And uh, once again, that's part of the program of this government. So we must have a new hydrocarbon law. We are going to do that, and that will solve many, many problems, many questions uh, around oil policy, Iraqi oil policy, or their, uh, KRG oil policy. But in general, we need a new law, and that will solve uh, these problems that you have mentioned. As for Total, we were in Paris the other day, and. We had discussions with uh, mm, the company. It is true, we didn't reach an agreement, but we didn't close the door. There will be more talks within a short time. Within a short <coughs> few days from now, there will be new talks with Total. We want to reach an agreement with Total. We know that that's important for, uh, for the country, especially for let's say, uh, gas and oil issues. Uh, once again, the door is open for a negotiation with Total. And there will be um, these talks within a short time. Thank you very much. You. Well, Your Excellency, we would love to stay with you more, but you've had a very busy schedule, many uh, days of non-stop work, long days. We have also a long trip to prepare for, wishing you safe return to Baghdad and to continue your work. Um, and also, I would like to thank the delegation that came with you and also thank the embassy of the Republic of Iraq here in Washington for their continued partnership and hard work uh, that made many things, including this, uh, this conversation possible. We wish you all the success. Um, you are one of the Iraqi national leaders who have 
served the Iraqi people, all the Iraqi people with distinction and honorably. And we thank you for that. Uh, it's an honor to be with you. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Abbas, for having me <coughs> here. And thanks uh, the audience and also to those people who were following this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much. For Appreciate it. having Please. me here. Thank you.